Bakewell on the 23rd of October 1957. I have been turning over in my mind the possibility of a television treatment for that fall, and I believe there may be a way of doing it. If you were at all interested, I would very much welcome an opportunity of having a talk with you about it, and would be most grateful for any suggestions or critical options you might have. While Bakewell's response has not been found, McQuinney briefly elaborated on his ideas in his book, The Art of Radio, from 1959. I'm quite sure whether... Sorry, I'll just check whether... Oh, no, okay. So, I'll go back to the initial... Oh, let's keep it up there. Um, so this is um, McQuinney in The Art of Radio. How would a visual medium interpret the moment in all that fall when Mrs. Rooney pauses as she catches sight of the laburnum, not by a loving close shot of the laburnum? The only possible way of achieving the emotive effect is by not depicting the, made a the main agent in the scene. That is to say, by leaving the laburnum to the imagination and relying on the words and the actress to create it in the mind of the audience. In this approach, the visual medium of television does not expose what is merely posited in sound, but leaves intact some of radio's suggestiveness as a so-called blind medium by focusing on Maddie's facial expressions in reaction to the object she perceives off camera. It is unclear if the project did not go through because the BBC rejected the idea or because Becca disliked it, but the latter is more likely. On the 28th of November 1957, soon after McQuinney left Paris, where he may have revealed his plans, Beckett impressed it on the producer that he can't bear the thought of a dramatised version of All That Fall, thus putting the BBC project to rest. How then do we square such refusal with Beckett's permission, given less than six months later for French direction director Alain René to make a film of the radio play? Beckett explained part of the reason himself in a letter to American theatre director Alan Schneider on the 27th of April, 1958. Talk also of a film, Alain René, of the French All That Fall. I have not yet given the green light for this, but so admire René that I probably shall. On the same day, Beckett wrote a more extensive letter to Mary Hutchinson, there is talk of making a, a film of the French All That Fall. Alain René, who did Nuit et Briard, Night and Fog, and some excellent court métrages, including one on the Bibliothèque Nationale. I feel inclined to let him do it, though I don't much like the thing in French. Nuit et Briard, 1956, is a controversial docu-film about the Nazi concentration camps, and the short film on the Bibliothèque Nationale de France is Toute la mémoire du monde, all the Memory of the World, from 1957, on that slide. As Beckett already signalled in his letters to Schneider and Hutchinson, his admiration for the French filmmaker appears to have been so great that he was even prepared to let his radio play be televised in a French translation, which he considered, by all known accounts, to be inferior. As Beckett told Barbara Bray on the 3rd of May, 1958, he was to meet Alain René next Monday to discuss the idea. Even McQuinney appears to have known about it, for on the 16th of June, 1958, he inquired, how is the film of All That Fall? What Beckett and René discussed is unclear, but that the meeting took place is confirmed by Beckett's letter to John Manning of the 15th of October, 1959, in which he states, I have met René. Possibly their meeting was unsuccessful, we simply do not know. In any case, the idea disappeared from Beckett's correspondence until 1962, when a young Franco-Bulgarian director, Michel Mitrani, was put in charge of the project. By this time, it had become a telefilm, commissioned by the Radio Diffusion Télévision Française, RT, uh, RTF, starring famous actors Guy Tréjean and Alice Saprich. The exact motivation behind this switch in media, I'm quite sure if that's the right slide, but never mind. The exact motivation behind this switch in media from film to television, in addition to directors, is also shrouded in mystery, not to say rather puzzling, given the BBC's earlier bid and Mitrani's relative obscurity in the still early stage of his successful career. After filming was completed and the result broadcast on the 25th of January 1962, Beckett did not like it, as he told Con Leventhal. 
on the 1st of February 1963. In his letter to Schneider of the 6th of February 1963, Beckett claims it had been done badly, but he never cared to explain why, at least not in writing. What I would like to attempt in this paper is answer that question, or at least begin to, as I can do little more than scratch the surface here. I will do so first by assessing what may have attracted Beckett in the early work of René to consider him a suitable candidate for the film version of the radio play. Secondly, I want to understand how Matrani's interpretation for television may have failed in Beckett's view. To begin answering the first question, it's important to realise that Beckett's approval of René was entirely based on his documentary shorts. His first full-length feature film, Hiroshima Mon Amour, based on a screenplay by Marguerite Dura, did not appear until June 1959, at which point the All That Form film project had been temporarily abandoned. Beckett even dismissed Hiroshima as not satisfactory in his letter to Manning, yet still praised René as the most gifted director of the French Nouvelle Vague. Again, he did not elaborate on his opinion, inviting us to do so instead. In more than one way, Hiroshima is something of a mixed bag. The film was shot by two different cinematographers, Sacha Vionny, René's trusted partner on 10 films, including Nuit et Brouillard, and Michio Takahashi, which explains the clashing visual styles of the film. The opening sequence and several of the later intermezzos carry the signature look of René's docu-films, with humans being either absent or decentered. They blend in with the objects and the setting, or to use Maddy's own phrase, merge into the masonry, an effect easier to achieve in monochrome than in colour. Most of the other sections consist of dialogue, conveyed at length from static camera angles, sometimes with shifting viewpoints and slow tracking shots when the characters move around. Shots, I think, there. It's giving you a, a, a sense of some of those film shots. Not just visually, but also in terms of plot, the film runs on two disjointed tracks. So this is Hiroshima Mon Amour. Much of the historical and political context of Hiroshima, addressed occasionally in the documentary scenes, is sacrificed to the somewhat banal and forcedly poetic romance of a French actress with a Japanese architect, creating an over-aestheticized and slightly effete result. The chemistry of the two leading characters is not helped either by the fact that Eiji Okada was ignorant French and had to memorize his lines phonetically. In his next feature film, L'année dernière à Marion Bad, last year at Marion Bad, based on a screenplay by Alain Robrier and shot entirely by Vionny, René was markedly more experimental in his use of the camera. There we go. And stuck more closely to the distant observational style that Beckett praised in the Nouveau Romancier's novels, for example, La Jalousie. Still, he was of the opinion that Marion Bad's approach quickly declined into a doctrine or a convention, dismissing its love story as banal and traditional. Although Anthony Paraskeva, in his book Beckett and Cinema, recognizes the film's influence in a number of Beckett's works, for obvious reasons of chronology, Marion Bad cannot have impacted on his decision in 1958, suggesting that when he agreed to René for a film version of All That Fall, he already preferred a documentary style to a narrative one. This prompts the question, what exactly it was that attracted Beckett so in René's docufilms? Nuit et Briard et toute la mémoire du monde, the only two that come up in Beckett's letters, are generally regarded and classified as documentary films, but they each approach the genre in a slightly different manner. Both report on a factual state of affairs, but Briard employs a combination of archival and original footage, the one in black and white to reflect the past, the other in colour to symbolise the present. So this is Nuit et Briard. Mémoire, by contrast, was entirely shot on location at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, solely in black and white. This distinction aside, their techniques are roughly the same. Brief close-ups alternate with zooms, pans and voiceover narration, which provides both explanatory and contrastive comments on the footage. It's quite likely that Beckett and René envisaged, 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 envisaged a similar treatment for all that four. 
though a major challenge would have been the portrayal of human beings, which figure rather rarely or marginally in the two René shorts Beckett alluded to, but which are of course central to the radio play. So Memoir showcases items from the library's collection, framing them from unusual camera angles, often barring viewers from recognising what they see at first sight. Okay, there we go. This visual alienation extends to the library itself as we explore its many exterior and interior spaces through a series of stairs, hallways, corridors, vaults, and rooms. The same foregrounding of objects and structures characterizes Brouillard, whose eerie atmosphere arises on the one hand from heaps of discarded items, such as shoes, spectacles, combs, brushes, cups, and hair. It, it's, it's a very powerful film. On the other hand, empty buildings and demolished barracks stress the dehumanizing effect of the Holocaust. Humans who figure abundantly in the archival footage are either objectified as piles of dead bodies resembling the heaps of discarded items or recast as emaciated ghosts and specters nearly rid of all flesh. Oh, dear. Quite literally, the film explains how corpses were turned into soap. Such radical disembodiment, together with the appearance of train tracks in Briard, inevitable in the context of mass deportation, and also the curious use of a drop-down microphone for the voiceover in Memoir, makes it easy to grasp why René was considered suitable for a film version of the radio play, which also features a railroad and was designed for voices, not bodies. Unsurprisingly, one of the elements that Matrani's telefilm adaptation struggles with the most is its portrayal of the ever-present human body. This problem arises mainly from the fact that what stays hidden in the radio medium, due to its so-called blindness, is instantly made visible on the screen, an argument Beckett repeatedly raised against requests for theatre adaptations. The entire experience of all that fall on the radio revolves around the fact that listeners cannot see what is going on and rely on Maddie Rooney for information. Yet there is a, quote, rupture of the lines of communication, to quote Beckett, because everything we hear in the radio play is filtered through the distorting and possibly deranged perception of Maddie. We can never trust what we hear, an effect that sound designer Desmond Briscoe created by manipulating the soundscape in a variety of ways with flutter echoes and tape feedback. However, while the radio version of All That Fall is completely subjectivized, nothing is seen through Maddie's eyes in Matrani's adaptation, which mostly uses external and non-diegetic points of view. It was certainly possible to recreate a similar subjectified experience in the audiovisual TV medium by equally filtering the sound through Maddie's distorting senses, but Matrani makes no such attempt, instead treating all acoustics realistically and shifting the focus away from perceiving to being perceived. In this respect, the telefilm starts out promisingly. Now, there's a clip here, uh, so we'll see whether that works or not. Oh, there is. Oh, it's magic. Monsieur Tiller, agent de change à la retraite, fait quelques pas avec Madame René. It's basically telling the story of the of of the radio play. 
against muddy walls. So this is muddy. secrétaire au champ de Celui-ci propose à Madame René de l'accompagner jusqu'à la gare. Next slide. So it, it, it's like it gives you a kind of summary <laughs> of the plot uh, of Maddie's journey to the station. Although it does give away most of the plot and removes much of the narrative tension, the panoramic, top-down, and godlike perspective offered by the helicopter nicely resonates with the biblical illusion in the radio play's title, the Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down. Additionally, the eerie sounds of the theremin, combined with the matter-of-fact voiceover, suggests it is going to be an unconventional viewing and listening experience. The opening shots replace the farmyard noises of the radio play with extreme close-up of animal eyes. These are fascinating, aren't they? It, this is before a film. No, you continue more. <laughs> the eyes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. 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 Got it. Stopped. Okay. So these in turn prefigure Beckett's own use of them in film. Another visual parallel with film occurs when Matrani exploits the likeness of round objects to the circular shape of an eye. For example, the bowl on the side of Christie's cart, the headlights on Mr. Slocum's car, or the various buttons on Mr. Barrel's uniform. So. Okay. These recall the holes in the back of O's rocking chair, the buttons on his coat sleeves, the hole in his key, the peephole in the door, or the closures on his folder, which are meant to evoke the constant danger of being perceived unwittingly. Okay. So these are the, pa the parallels between uh, the two circuits qui tombe and film. Okay. It thus seems that Matrani is trying to find a visual equivalent for the acoustic experience in the radio version of All That Fall, but it never develops into a narrative tension like the agony of perception in Beckett's film, which O oh so desperately tries to avoid and which marries form to content, one of Beckett's primary concerns, even in his adaptations. Maddie, by contrast, seems blissfully unaware, except when Christie's Hinney looks at her and she begs him to remove its clegg tormented eyes, a scene that was already part of the radio play. Matrani could have capitalized more on the scene to create a leap motif throughout the production, but on the whole, his TV adaptation offers little in return for what is lost in the transmedial displacement from air to screen. So this is the concluding paragraph. 
Not that his television version of All That Fall is particularly unpleasant to watch. On the contrary, its visual style is quite accomplished in general, boasting an impressive array of angles, viewpoints, and arrangements. Yet all things considered, they add very little in terms of visual storytelling, and they often feel like embellishment. Perhaps Beckett learned and benefited from this artistic shortcoming when he came to write his own film script in the months that followed, even helping to produce it in New York the next year. Thank you. So what we're going to do is have all four papers and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for discussion, but rather than taking any questions for Pim now, which I will make a record of. If you have any comments, any feedback on Pim's paper, I will make a note of those and feed it back to Pim, as indeed to Derval. But now we're going to hear from Jonathan Bignall. So Jonathan is professor of TV and film at the University of Reading. He has published on widely on television and media, um, but of course he has written a, a key text on uh, Beckett and television and film indeed, Beckett on screen, um, the, the television plays. Um, and um, he's, he's written many um, e essays on Beckett and the screen. Um, he's also written essays in, in Beckett and Nothing um, and other collections. He is a trustee of the Beckett International Foundation at Reading um, and executive of the Beckett Research Centre, where I also work. Sorry, I, I realise I forgot to introduce myself as Anna McMullen. So if anybody is interested, actually, in um, anything to do with the foundation at Reading, the archive at Reading, then you can talk to, to Jonathan and myself. But Jonathan's paper today is Adaptation and Value, Beckett on Film, on TV. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, the thank you uh, the the sequence of screen versions of Beckett's plays called Beckett on Film, uh, and I'm interested particularly in the way that this material crosses from one medium to another, and from one context to another across a period of years. And I want to ask the question of how Beckett on film changes as it moves across these different media contexts. So how does Beckett on film change? And is it the same thing when it moves from one media context to another? Uh, I'm going to approach this by thinking about the question of value and ask the question, for whom? does the Beckett on Film project have a value? What is the value that is attributed to the Beckett on Film project by the people who appropriate it in different media contexts? Um, so, um, but my first slide shows the advertisement uh, for the American television screening of the Beckett on Film series uh, on the television channel PBS, Public Broadcasting. And I want to draw your attention to a few features of this advertisement, which I'm going to return to later in my talk. First of all, notice the prominence of Beckett's face and Beckett's name um, to that image. Secondly, I want you to notice the, uh, the language of the advertising line at the top of the advertisement, which says, the American broadcast premiere of eight plays on film in a two-night tribute to one literary giant. So we're being told here that this is a broadcast, as TV, that these are plays, they're from theatre, that they are on film, made on film, um, and that they derive from a literary context um, from their creator who is a literary giant. So there are a number of ideas in play here that tell us about what kind of material this is and how we might begin to understand it. But I draw your attention to the ways in which different media are brought together in this single sentence. So 
So in case you don't know the story of how Beckett on Film came to be made, this is a short outline of the story. Beckett on Film um, derives from a series of theatre plays which were put on at the Gate Theatre in Dublin, in Ireland, as a festival of 19 of Beckett's stage works in 1991. And this was part of, a, of a, a major public festival of Beckett's theatrical work, which claimed Beckett as an Irish writer. Um, so although, of course, Beckett came from Ireland, he lived mostly in France. He wrote in English and in French, not in Irish. So there's a question about where Beckett belongs. But the Beckett on film, uh, sorry, the, the, the Gate Theatre Beckett theatre productions claimed Beckett as an Irish writer within that national context. So that's the first place and the first media context in which I want to, to put this material. Then, later on, uh, the plays were filmed using money deriving from the Irish Film Board, which is a government-supported agency in Ireland which supports the making of cinema films um, in Ireland. And there was also funding from Irish Television, RTE, which is the Irish television channel, and the British t TV channel, Channel 4. So they collaborated to shoot uh, versions of the theatre festival productions uh, using film cameras, film facilities. And then the resulting films were called Beckett on Film, and they toured internationally um, around the year 2000, 2001. Um, we might notice that as well as money deriving from uh, the agency that supports cinema, it was television companies that provided some of the funding for the Beckett on Film series, uh, and that meant that um, those television channels had rights to broadcast the films on TV uh, for their television audiences, both in Ireland, in Britain, and also potentially around the world. Um, and so the Beckett on Film series of films became television when they were screened in Ireland, the UK, the USA, and elsewhere around 2001, 2002. So theatre becomes film and then becomes television. Um, these were, it, the first broadcasts were in the evening TV schedule for the general television audience. But then later, the plays were shown for school children during the daytime um, in Britain in 2004 um, by the Channel 4 television channel. So the audience changes from being um, the general um, adult family audience to specifically an educational audience. So again, the, the, the productions change their media context. Uh, then um, there was a DVD release of Beckett on film, uh, which was available for purchase as a box set of DVD discs in 2005 over the usual suppliers like Amazon, for example. And then finally, nearer to our own time, uh, various individuals uploaded the, the productions to YouTube. Um, these were not official uh, uploads of the material. They, they contravene the, the copyright of, of the original producers, but nevertheless, they still remain I, I, right now on YouTube, oh, and you can see them for nothing. So they move finally to an internet context rather than either film or TV. So as you can see, I tell you this story because it shows uh, that this is a, a set of productions which shifts its media context and therefore raises questions about adaptation because the plays change when they move to a different media context. It also asks questions about national identity and cultural identity because of the relationship between Ireland and Irishness and the English companies that supported the production and then their international transmission uh, on television and on DVD and on the internet. So there are uh, movements between media and movements across geographical space. So. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> this then raises questions of belonging. Where does Beckett on film belong? What is it? Uh, what is its identity and how should we categorize it? The first thing to notice 
is that Beckett's own name becomes the central focus around which the identity of this material is, is grouped. Um, Beckett's name is the center of its, of its meaning, which holds its differences together. However, Beckett himself is not in any of the films. There are no sequences featuring Beckett himself. So he is, in a sense, absent, as well as being present in the productions. It moves from theater to a film festival, to TV, to schools TV, to DVD, then a sequence of videos. So is this film? Well, no, mostly it's not film. Uh, it's something other than that. It's, it's another kind of production. It's an example of a kind of transmedia product that exploits the convergence between media and the possibilities of moving a text across the boundaries between one medium and another. Um, my two images on the slide there show you the final credit screen at the end of the Beckett on Film productions, which shows you the logos of the different companies which invested money in the production of uh, these films. So those are the logos of Blue Angel Films, um, Tyrone Productions, the RTE Television Channel, Channel 4 Television, the Irish Film Board. So these are the people who claim ownership of this property in the sense that they invested in its making. And they come from several different types of media context. And the image on the right is an advertisement for the DVD box set. Now, I think some of the productions within Beckett on Film draw attention to, to the um, adaptation uh, that has been made of Beckett's original theatre work. These are what we could call reflexive adaptations, which make a kind of internal commentary on the way that the theatre plays have been transformed into something else. So, for example, in the play Rockabye, there are some types of shot which I associate with uh, the TV documentary genre. Notably, for example, the use of close-ups of the protagonist's hands sitting on her lap like this, which is a, a shot conventionally used in documentary during a confessional speech or interviews, something which comes from a television genre. In Act Without Words 2, um, the theatre play draws on the conventions of silent film. That's the image that you can see on my slide, uh, in which there are film frames, like a strip of celluloid film, um, and black and white or sepia colors, which are the colors of silent cinema. So this is a production which alludes to the film history. Uh, and we see two men, the characters in uh, Act Without Words, doing a kind of physical comedy performance. Uh, which refers to the tradition of vaudeville or, or a slapstick comedy as seen in the films of Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton, for example. So there are ways in which this production points outwards to, to different kinds of media context again. Let me give you a, a, another example, which is the production of Play, directed by Anthony Minghella which um, prominently features some of the material features of celluloid film, the material of film production. We can see some images like the one on the left-hand side of my slide, which are the images of what's called the leader strip of film, which is the piece of um, almost blank film, which is put into a film projector when you load the film up to play it. So it has numbers on it uh, which cue up the beginning of the soundtrack of the film. It's not meant to be part of the film itself. It's a kind of paratextual piece of material that belongs both inside and outside of the film and is to do with the material qualities of the celluloid reel. Similarly, also in play, Anthony Minghella uses uh, a whole range of cinematic techniques, including pans, tilts, and zoom shots close-ups, overhead shots, long shots, the whole vocabulary of cinema to make his version of Beckett's play, uh, which uh, is something which is quite different from the way that the play would be performed in a theatrical context. So there are ways in which this production also draws attention to the fact that it has moved between media.
Um, Beckett on film um, was shown on TV, as I said, in Ireland and in Britain. Um, but in its first showings, it was comparatively unsuccessful from um, the broadcaster's point of view. So thinking about the question of value, um, it had relatively little value in the conventional ways in which TV program success is measured. It had uh, low numbers of viewers, that's low ratings. It had uh, a small share of the audience, the, the proportion of the audience who are watching as compared to another competing channel. Um, and it had small reach, which is the, um, the proportion of the available audience which is watching the program. So according to these measures in the TV industry, the Beckett on film television screenings were relatively unsuccessful. Um, I've given you on my slide some of the actual numbers for some of the productions. Uh, so the population of Ireland when these plays were shown on Irish television was about 4 million people. Um, and Crap's Last Tape, which was shown with Act Without Words 2, was the most popular of the TV screenings. And it had 136,000 viewers, which is a very small proportion of the total 4 million population. By comparison, the British soap opera EastEnders, which is shown on RTE, um, got nearly half a million viewers, so many more viewers. And the Irish soap opera, very popular Irish TV program, um, got uh, three quarters of a million viewers, again, far more viewers. Um, Waiting for Godot, which is Beckett's most famous play, I suppose, got a remarkably small audience of only 87,000 viewers. So that's the story in Ireland in terms of one measure of value. In Britain, screenings on Channel 4 uh, were also uh, comparatively unsuccessful in the sense that the plays were scheduled at a variety of different times in the broadcast schedule, and it was hard to know when you would have the opportunity to see them. You would have to buy a listings magazine and then look through all of the, the, the times of day to, to discover where Beckett's film materials had been placed because they're all over the different um, times in, in the day. <clears throat> so what, what Channel 4 did <clears throat> with the productions was to change their audience. Um, they didn't show them again to a national general audience. They showed the plays to school children in their school's programming, which is during the daytime, uh, aimed at 14-year-old to 19-year-old students who are showing, uh, who are studying the plays in school. So we can see that uh, as Beckett Run film productions move from one media context to another, they are used differently by the people who own and broadcast them and their value changes in the sense that they're directed to different kinds of audiences who get different things from them. Yeah, <clears throat> so to summarize my argument, First of all, Beckett on Film was a tool used in Ireland for building uh, the cultural identity of Ireland and Irishness using the name of Beckett as a kind of central um, brand which could be associated with his homeland. And the Beckett on Film productions were exported from their Irish origins around the world and became part of a process of festivalization um, in contexts uh, around the globe from America, Britain, Australia, various other countries. Um, <clears throat> so they became a kind of cultural event, a high profile cultural event as a festival. Then they broadcast to general audiences on television, on channels funded um, by um, public money. Um, um, but they were often screened at times when audiences were not very likely to see them, uh, and they didn't attract very high audience figures. The programs were then shown on TV to a school audience, which of course has great educational value for some uh, sections of that audience, but it's a small audience and very specific type of audience. The plays were made into a DVD, 
which could be uh, bought and was mainly bought, I suspect, by schools and universities for educational purposes, um, and also, of course, by some of us who are uh, Beckett fans. But uh, the box set of Beckett on film was quite expensive, I think something like $120. So we can see that the study of Beckett on film tells us about how a certain set of texts move from one media context to the next, how these productions are transferred, exchanged. They are also an economic property which has financial value. So I'm not talking here particularly about Beckett on film from a textual point of view, but from the question of things like um, branding, commerce, um, and the cultural significance of Beckett's work as a whole. We can see how texts become cultural commodities in the context of a transmedial global market in media forms and media texts. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, the f I should say that the full biographies are on the web. Um, so you can find those. I'm giving a kind of abbreviated version here, although I should have said about Pim Verhulst that he's a board member of the, the Beckett Digital Manuscript Project, the BDMP, and his the making of Samuel Beckett's radio plays is one of their series of publications. So we now move to um, a, a another centre for Beckett Studies. Um, and... Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Nicholas Johnson, um, who is a, um, a lecturer in um, the Samuel Beckett um, uh, Center for Drama there. And he is co-founder of the Samuel Beckett Laboratory at the Trinity College Dublin Summer School. I think that's quite important in relation to uh, Nicholas's work as both a scholar and a artist practitioner. He works across those boundaries. Um, and he has co-edited with Jonathan Heron from Warwick the performance issue of the Journal of Beckett Studies and has a forthcoming um, book uh, co-edited, co-written, co co fantastic, on experimental Beckett. So excited about that. And uh, Nick is going to talk uh, his paper today is Listen to the Light, Pan Pan and Beckett's Radio Plays on Stage. Thank you so much, Anna. So in radio telephony, uh, Pan Pan refers to a signal of urgency, contrasted with May Day for emergency, suggesting that the station calling has a very urgent message to transmit concerning the safety of a station or person, but does not require immediate assistance. A leading exponent of Ireland's theatrical avant-garde since the company's founding in 1991, Pan Pan Theatre has spent nearly 30 years seeking to live up to their name by maintaining a sense of liveness, tension, and exigency in both process and product. Referring to this ethos in an interview with Irish Theatre Magazine in 2011, in which the company's new production of All That Fall was billed as something of a 20th century or a 20th anniversary celebration for the company, director Gavin Quinn who leads the company collaboratively with designer Adian Cosgrove, says this, this approach, uh, it's always about ideas and how we feel they will communicate to an audience at a particular time and place. And this approach is explicitly contrasted with the more literary theater that dominated Ireland at the time of the company's founding. Quinn discloses a broad spectrum of influences ranging from the French art theater to the Polish avant-garde of the 1980s, saying that, we started looking at all forms of theater, theater as an open form of expression in the usual way that an experimental artist would begin. The company explicitly drew on the relations between music, visual art, and theater to fashion its own performance vocabulary, moving gradually from the edges of the Irish theater culture and a lot of time spent on tour to its celebrated center. It is no accident that in the mix of peripheral, experimental, and difficult to classify artists central to Pan Pan's development, Cosgrove and Quinn found a strong link to Samuel Beckett. Sufficient for Quinn to say in the same interview, Beckett was always there. Both artists had worked on the first Gate Theater Festival of Beckett's plays, the one Jonathan referred to uh, in 1991, and both supported master practitioners in the early years, including David Warlow and Sarah Jane Scaife. 
However, from the perspective of post-2006 Ireland, after the year of Beckett's centenary and his attendant induction into the cultural pantheon of celebrated Irish writers, Pan Pan staging Beckett could seem at first like an inexplicable contradiction, or at least a mismatch of some kind. This was not, however, simply a sudden turn from the obscure continental toward the canonical Irish. It was, in fact, a far more complex negotiation of past and present, tradition and innovation. The terms of this negotiation echo, to some extent, Beckett's own paradox, how to be both Irish and European, how to explore the periphery while living at the center. How does the avant-garde spend its time after the war or after the Nobel is won? Pen Pen's rereadings of older texts always highlighted the porous boundaries between visual art, sound art, theater design, installation, live art, and performance. Their approach to Beckett was no different, and it did not emerge from a vacuum. After a visual citation of Endgame in their 2010 production of Playing the Dane, which was a remix of Hamlet featuring a large Great Dane dog, Pan Pan developed a Beckett series that has seen great success since 2011, beginning with All That Fall, moving to Embers in 2013, and Cascando in 2016, as well as working in the interim with Quad in a lecture demonstration that includes a mathematics lecture and collaboration with ballet dancers. The approach to the radio work has been largely to hide or disguise actors, but to place the audience in a specially developed listening chamber or installation space in which their senses of sight, sound, and even smell in the early version of All That Fall uh, are manipulated. So I have some visuals um, for those of you who may not have seen these productions. Um, this is the uh, All That Fall chamber uh, for listening. You can see the wall of Parkhan uh, lights. The audience sits on small uh, cushions there that have a skull painted on them. And uh, the, the floor, which you may not see, is a large children's sort of play mat um, with a little town and city. So something that would be familiar, um, particularly in Ireland, as a kind of play, uh, play surface or playground. Um, this is the sort of insane list uh, of places this has toured since then, and it's still going. This is not a complete list. And uh, that's the cast in the upper left, and you can see the audience um, sitting in that image there. Um, that's from the Sydney production. Then uh, embers placed bodies semi-visibly inside this giant sculpture of a skull, uh, which, uh, and, and then uh, actors who were visible at the very beginning then go into the skull and perform the text live um, across this vast network of thousands of hanging speakers. So those are all speakers, uh, active speakers that are there hanging. Um, quite a physical sensation to be in the room, um, sort of uh, sitting with a sonic immersion. And uh, this is the collaborator, uh, Andrew Clancy, the sculptor who built that, um, and Gavin Quinn standing uh, inside the skull during its construction. The adaptation of Cascando uh, built a giant maze uh, in the same theater, in the Beckett Theater, uh, during which uh, audience members each wearing a jellaba, so they would be asked to come in and uh, put a jellaba over their clothes, take off their shoes, put on a specially selected headphones, and hear uh, a rendition of the text, very carefully edited, and follow uh, some walkers through this maze. And uh, moving through this as a group, you can see um, the de Aideen's uh, design for the maze there. Um, it's quite disorienting when you get inside there, and that is the surface of those walls, so the surfaces are reflective. Um, that's Gavin being reflected in a photo uh, of the surface, and the floor was reflective as well. So when light was playing around in there, it was extremely disorienting, um, physically uh, feeling kind of vertigo. What becomes immediately clear when confronting this uh, performance as a series is that the embodiment of the audience has been considered and generally included as an integral part of the event. Social sculpture, uh, which is Quinn's term for the sonography of all that fall, ideally captures the collapse of boundaries that Pan Pan's approach entails. The body of the listener and viewer is no longer a passive recipient of art, but suddenly its active producer. The bodies in the room are performing for one another. Sculpture becomes dissociated from its solitary and static tradition. The, uh, the plastic work of art is suddenly networked, organic, dynamic. And he even collaborated with a visual artist in the uh, poster work. Um, Richard Gorman did the prints uh, live, or previously specifically commissioned for this work. And this environment and blend of art forms returns our attention to the phenomenology of sound. Though invisible, this audio is boundless and unbounded in the room. 
ubiquitous and pervasive, and as each category of art is carefully subverted, the theater serves not only as a resonator for the concerns of Beckett's texts, but also as a surface on which the cultural change in the medium of radio becomes visible. This disruption spreads to encompass theater history as well. Invoking the symbolist tradition of synesthesia, we are asked to listen to the light, as Beckett has it in Embers. In addition to seeing these works as affected by cultural flows and changes in what constitutes media in general, this translation of Beckett's radio plays by Pan Pan also comments and responds specifically to the medium of radio, just as Beckett's interventions did in his time. Radio exists on a strange border, and Beckett continuously exploits its paradoxes in the composition of these plays. A voice comes to one in the dark, and the voice is both intimate and ubiquitous at once, the disembodied presence of a stranger in one's own rooms. In the history, nope. In the history of radio as a medium, there are both solitary and communal modes of listening. Although early units required headphones, it was not long before the wireless was a focal point for family life and recreation in the years before television. Though its pervasiveness did not kill audio-only media, television has made radio seem somehow old-fashioned. Digital culture in the current century has brought clearer sound and more control for both senders and receivers. It's now much easier to record, rewind, replay, and edit a broadcast, even for listeners. Innovations like the compact disc, the laptop, the podcast have made today's radio more like a novel, or perhaps a library of novels, where the user has absolute control over selecting, starting, and stopping the content. So the first conceptual innovation in Pan Pan's stage productions of Beckett's radio plays is really, I think, a throwback to their first broadcasts in the late 1950s, the fact that one must appear at a particular time and place in order to experience them. Audiences of these plays, like their original broadcast listeners, are no longer wholly in control, and they are listening together. An odd feature of the medium's history, and one worthy of further reflection, is that radio broadcasting continues to flourish in the 20th century at all. This came up uh, during uh, questions for, for Everett's paper. Certainly the reasons are partly economic. Radio remains the cheapest and most democratic form of mass media, with low operating costs relative to the number of people one antenna can reach. I'd venture to say it's much more important in parts of the world where these media are not as pervasive as they are um, in, the, in the wealthy West. But the fact that television has not fully supplanted radio suggests that what audio-only broadcasting offers is substantively different than video, and apparently is even irreplaceable by internet. With only a few technological upgrades, this century-old technology has survived and maintained its own market, its own loyal adherence, and its own reasons to be. Why is this? I would suggest that what's durable about radio as a broadcast medium might be the same fundamental principle that makes Beckett's theater different, the expressive power of absence. It is, in fact, about the ambiguity that Beckett is so careful to protect. On the radio, it is precisely the invisibility of the bodies the uncertain origins of the sounds, and the resulting instability of the stage world that work together to activate the imagination of the audience. The optimal way to experience radio drama, as many listeners of the BBC Third Program did habitually when these were first broadcast, was to sit in darkness for the entire piece, turning one's room into a private theater. And when you hear radio like this, it puts all the senses to work. Such active listening is less and less common now, however, and the pace of life seems to agitate against it. So these radio plays have already had radical adaptations every time someone has listened inattentively or walked into a different room, uh, been distracted driving in traffic while listening to them. So against this drift, I think Pan Pan is shaping a listening chamber that powerfully directs one focus to the texts, Beckett's thought, and the performances of the actors. So they've shaped a kind of sonic, visual, tactile, and even olfactory experience of the listeners in a way that draws attention without disturbing the disembodiment which is so fundamental to these pieces. And once again, this faithfulness to the sense of occasion, a feature of Beckett's own experience listening to the radio during the war and as the experience of his first listeners, complicates, I think, the inevitable questions of authorial fidelity. In keeping with the dialectic theater for which the company is known, Pan Pan's adaptations reflect both continuity and break. It's a fun one. Those who have ever attended a post-show discussion 
after a Beckett production in the Anglosphere, are no doubt familiar with a dominant perception that Beckett resisted modification of stage directions and the adaptation of his work across media. Among scholars of Beckett, it's also known that his apparent reluctance to transgress what Beckett called genre was at best inconsistently applied. We've heard about these already, but just briefly, Beckett authorizes and collaborates with such translations from stage to screen, uh, Waiting for Gatto in 61 and 77, Play, Not I, What, Where, uh, multiple stagings of All That Fall, one of Embers during his lifetime. And the citation trotted out in nearly every case where this theoretical prohibition is mentioned is the Barney Rossett letter uh, from 27 August 1957, because it refers specifically to All That Fall. For reasons of time, I'm not going to read this to you, but I'm gonna call your attention to one feature which I suspect may have been overlooked. And what I'd like you to skip down to is the word theater, the word staged at the top third line, theater and act. And I've transcribed here the punctuation of the letters. And I want to point out that he uses what might be called scare quotes around these terms, staged, theater, and act. So it says, I don't want to have it staged, right? I don't want it to be acted. We can hear, in a sense, a tone of voice here that it could be judged as somewhat sarcastic or at least referring more specifically to a particular approach to staging, acting, and theater rather than referring to the medium in its absolute character. Obviously, others have examined this letter in detail and found related oscillations. Everett Frost has argued convincingly, um, both in his preface to the new Faber edition that collects the broadcast work and in other contexts, that Beckett's attention to the ontology of the form of broadcast media is what these objections were really about. Of particular concern was the relationship to ambiguity that was essential to the radio work due to its being constituted by voice only with bodies absent. Regarding Adafatros, uh, Beckett's pun for the crossing of genre in this way, uh, Frost writes this. He says, the issue was not primarily about whether or not one might achieve an aesthetically satisfactory result by adapting the work for another medium, but rather of not obliterating its medium-specific intentionalities. For example, by moving elusively abstract works, works in the direction of a plausible realism and intelligibility. Though Frost expresses skepticism of such projects on the ground of the first half of this quote, the second half, I think, clearly has a loophole. If a theatrical rendering of the radio work could preserve elusive abstraction, or avoid plausible realism, or even intelligibility, then it might not run afoul of such a prohibition. Even Beckett himself, in his comment to Ludovic uh, Janvier, cited by Frost, shows the same divide and reveals a surprisingly limited view, I think, of what constitutes stage performance. Knowing the tradition of modernism and postmodern dramaturgy, if our ethics are strongly oriented toward authorial fidelity, I think we have to think about the impact of modernism in the 20th century artistic tradition preceding these comments by 50 years or more is in many ways an excavation of the idea of ambiguity, a refutation of verisimilitude on stage, the substitution of the apparent truth of what is visible for deeper truths, the dynamic or the technological realm for the futurists, the territory of dreams for the symbolists, the realm of emotion for the expressionists, the realm of imagination, eros, and danger for the surrealists, I think the list goes on. Great. And Beckett's own insights into ambiguous embodiment, his contribution to the theater, is a key station on the journey toward the postmodern dramaturgy of politics and thought, which is exactly part of his influence on contemporary theaters, uh, theater makers such as Pan Pan. So, in other words, a visual production need not destroy ambiguity in the contemporary aesthetics of the theater. So to conclude, in the extended version of this paper, uh, I explore each radio play in greater detail to demonstrate, oh, it's over, um, to demonstrate how particular scenographic and conceptual choices in each of the Pan Pan adaptations is consciously enacting a kind of uh, border thinking around time, space, embodiment, and media. And these enactments of ambiguity, presence both in the source text and source medium, positions these theatrical events as emblematic of a contemporary renegotiation of borders in media, technology, and the culture industries. The spectrum from tradition to innovation in Pan Pan's radio adaptations reveals how Beckett's work continues to operate in relation to intermediality and interdisciplinarity today. And Pan Pan's experience, I think, point toward a new horizon of the many possible future Becketts, a living legacy that is open to the imagination of alternatives 
while still being conscious of what is integral to his radical creations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, I think uh, we're now loading um, Derville Chubridge's paper, and I'll introduce um, Derville while we're doing that. But I also just want to draw your attention tomorrow night. We're having a theatrical performance of Malloy by Gar St. Lazar Players. You also have a long history of adapting Beckett, so we're looking forward to that. And Judy Hegarty Lovett will be talking about her experience on Friday afternoon. So, um, Dervil, um, Dr. Derville Turbidy is Senior Lecturer in the Department of English and Comparative Literature at Goldsmiths, University of London, and she's co-director of the London Beckett Seminar at the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So if you're passing through London on a Friday, you might just check the web, um, because that's a series of monthly seminars um, that are, are, are definitely worth catching. Um, she specialises in modern contemporary literature and also in performance and the visual arts. So she's published, she's actually published on Irish studies as well as um, on Beckett, people like Thomas Kinsella. Um, but her Beckett work has appeared in Journal of Beckett Studies, um, in recent edited collections around staging Beckett in Great Britain, um, and her monograph on Samuel Beckett and the language of subjectivity has just been published by Cambridge University Press in June 2018. And she's going to talk um, in a recorded version, unfortunately she can't be with us today, and her paper is on Beckett and contemporary art. No, I, it's, it's nothing specific. It, it isn't a specific repost um, to that. It's, it's pointing out that the discourse of uh, why the adaptations might not work is inherently about the fact that there are visuals. And I'm suggesting that visuals can contain ambiguity. That's, that's the, the baseline argument, is not to say specifically that they're answering some kind of specific call. It's more that I think that ambiguous visuals are possible. I think Beckett is a master of ambiguous visuals. And so visual performance that preserves ambiguity is, I think, an available avenue for experimenting with the work. Um, that, that's, that's the material that I'm trying to, to work with. I think each time that Beckett issued a prohibition or that, he, that he's writing to Jean Vier or your own articulation of that, there is an emphasis on the visual inherently having that problem. And I think that, that's, I think that misses something in Beckett's own contribution to that ambiguous visual on stage, which I think Pan Pan is steeped in. So I'm, I'm offering the possibility that there is a, uh, a world in which the, the mix that they're drinking in from modernism and postmodernism um, makes this avenue available for pieces that, that, can, that can come to exist for it. Um, I think, obviously, it's still a matter of taste um, as to whether people enjoy those works, but of course, I'm trying to write a a piece of philosophy about that, not a review. You know, so it isn't um, saying how I feel about the work one way or the other. It's trying to say there is an, an avenue through which ambiguity can be preserved in the work. And I, I think they're doing that through the combination of these images. That's all.
you. Um, I just got another question for, for Nick, actually, regarding the Pan Pan um, audience. Uh, I suppose participation might be the wrong word, but the involvement of the audience, and whether there were any, um, there was any feedback from audience members about their experience of being a part of those productions. Um, do Pan Pan show an interest in, in collecting that? Is there any kind yeah. of archive of that feedback? Um, they're, they're not systematic about it. Um, they're, they're not systematic about collecting the data. The three pieces actually have very different audience relations. Um, in All That Fall, the audience is present in the visual image if you're faced that way, but it's, it's static except that you're in a rocking chair. So it's sort of glorified proscenium. It's all around you. It's not really immersive in any real sense. You know, you're not moving during the performance. It's things are happening to you that are interfering with your perception. Um, very bright light at one moment, very loud noise at another. Uh, you know, there's a disorientation that's happening. So it is, um, there's a somatic experience going on, but it's only just above sitting in an audience, you know. Um, Embers is interesting because it's completely audience configuration. You're sitting in the rows just like that in a 200-seater, except that there's occasional wall of sound coming out at you from the speakers that are hanging in front. And so you have, uh, again, these sort of autonomic responses um, that are just, just happen um, as a result of that. Cascando is the most interventionist in that you're dressing up, you're changing, you're getting into a different space, you're feeling the floor with your feet, and you're sort of winding your way through. Um, the real line in that piece and a huge problem for the company was the issue of agency. So they ended up hiring uh, actors who were pretending to be audience members who would sort of corral the audience in the right way. And for me, I would have loved if that piece were truly exploratory, if you could go in and get lost and you were alone. Um, I think that would be the way to experience it. Um, the fact that there's kind of a track, a promenade that you're on, for me, slightly decreases that experience of investment. You know, it's not individual. So it's really wonderful to go in with the headphones and just run around the maze and, and feel that. Um, and it was timed and pitched for the pace of a walker. So it was very much considered in terms of how it would be heard and perceived at the same time as walking in that environment. Um, Sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, and I, when I said not systematically, I mean they didn't. Um, they, they were sent emails, they were sent individual stuff, no surveys per se, um, but there, there are, you know, anecdotal audience responses, um, and I have the show reports, so I know what was concerning the stage manager um, when there was a safety issue or somebody got stuck or something went wrong um, night after night. So you can also see the evolution of the company thinking about its audience and what management they needed to do. So that's quite an interesting um, archival bit. And of are the those piece. reports available to be viewed, or is it just that you requested them? And um, well, I have a conflict of interest. Um, I was uh, I was dramaturg on that production, so I I, I, w I was on the circulation list. Um, so I, I have them. But Pan Pan is archiving their work uh, in uh, NUI Galway, so they they have an ongoing building archive. Um, so it is viewable. But if you'd like to see that, certainly just contact me. Thank you. Yeah. So it appears that we have a problem um, contacting or being able to project um, Derville's paper. So what we've, um, what Luz and the t Luz Maria and the team have suggested, is that we present Derville's paper in another slot. Um, so what that means is we've 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 run over time with various things, but we have just a couple of minutes. If there are any other questions we can take those so there's one immediately from there I already have the, the mic, mic too so. this one's for Jonathan but it bears on what Nick's been saying as well so in this uh, migration from the stage to YouTube what's the next step because once something ends up on YouTube it's easily manipulable by users you can add audio graphics cut it in different ways do all sorts of obscenities or blasphemies as we discussed yesterday uh, to the text um, yeah, thank you, Patrick. That's an interesting point. Um, as far as I'm aware, and other people may know better than me, I don't think anybody has been making scratch videos out of Beckett on film from YouTube, as far as I know. Uh, We've all seen, I think, this 70s cop show 
sort of promo with Beckett and the, you know, the disco music and all the rest of it. So I can imagine something similar happening with the, the video from, from Beckett on film. Yeah, I mean, the, the, of course, um, it's also interesting to look at what, what surrounds the Beckett on film productions when they're in that internet context, because you can look at the comments, and the comments are really interesting to read. Um, most of them say things like, um, I had to read this play for school, and I'm really glad that there's a video of it, you know, um, because it's really hard to understand, that kind of thing. So it's these are students who are saying these kind of things. And then there are people who say, you know, I love Beckett's work, it's really great, you know, I, this is the most moving play I've ever seen, that, that kind of thing. And then there are people who say, oh, this is so boring, I hate it. And so there's the whole spectrum of responses which touches on, on that, that question which we were just discussing, that one could make some kind of, um, um, make some research conclusions just using the comments on YouTube. And I, I also find it interesting to see how YouTube's autoplay feature puts things next to Beckett on film. Because obviously it will play you the next in the sequence of the plays, but it will also choose other things for you that it thinks you might like because you like Beckett on film. Because the algorithm, of course, you know, is in control. Um, so that's a whole other area of investigation about how um, the boundaries between Beckett's work and other works might be affected by that internet context. So I think this is a really rich area of investigation, and I've only really scratched the surface of it. But as I guess you, can, you could tell, the undercurrent of my talk is that there's a, quite a fundamental question of identity, I think, textual identity, around Beckett on film. And in fact, many of the posthumous adaptations of Beckett's work, um, as they have been evolved in various different contexts, because the plays start to shift and become something else once they, um, once they move to a different place. So the concept of, of, of place and identity and value, you know, to whom are these things important? What do they do with them? These are all things which I think are a fertile area for future research. Thank you. So just to say that because we're running out of time, we need to move on to the next panel. These we can continue conversations outside the, um, the, 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 the panel itself. And again, if anybody has any comments on Pim's paper, um, please come up to me and, and talk to me about that, and I'll pass that on to Pim. But thank you very much. Thanks to our speakers. <laughs> thank you.